Hey guys, Jeff Tack. So yesterday was the Almost Park rally in support of CJ Grisham and Open Carry Texas. If you don't know, there's been a lot of uh, a lot of issues in Almost Park. It's a smaller city uh, inside San Antonio. It's its own municipality. They have their own police department, their own mayor, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. It's a very small area in San Antonio, and uh, there've been a, there've been several uh, First Amendment, Second Amendment auditors that uh, have gone into Almost Park and um, through their efforts to uh, do audits in, in Almost Park, they've been arrested a few times. Now, um, you know, those, those audits, you know, you may question whether they're, they're um, common sense or they're good sense to do, but the purpose of the audits is to expose uh, violations of individual rights uh, by police departments that are poorly trained, um, have bad laws on the books, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Well, Almost Park PD uh, has proven to be an example of exactly what these auditors are looking for, and they found it uh, in spades in Almost Park. So, if you don't know, if you haven't uh, kept up with what's going on, go out and look at um, C.J. Grisham's uh, arrest in Almost Park. Uh, he was tased. Oh, let me back up a second. He he called the police chief the day before uh, his intended rally. And he did so with the um, purpose of finding out if there was going to be any movement on complaints that had been made in previous arrests of people who had violated the unlawful ordinance in the city of Almost Park. So he made this phone call. You know, he kind of kind of gave the chief a heads up that this was coming. And the next day, he held a protest out on uh, one of the main streets there in Almost Park. Police showed up in force, had weapons drawn, um, were barking orders, uh, were trying to make arrests, and when CJ was backing up, uh, he was tased, which resulted in him falling to the ground, um, you know, loss of motor, motor function, he fell to the ground, he hit his head pretty hard, and um, uh, he was then handcuffed. He was carried into the car uh, where he was taken to Bear County Jail, and booked into uh, booked into uh, the jail there. So there was another gentleman with him. I don't I don't know his name. Um, so I apologize for that. But uh, he was also um, violently handled uh, by the police department. Now, in order to make an arrest in Texas, you have to have probable cause of a crime. There was no crime. You know these guys were standing there with long arms. Uh, and I've and I've made a whole whole list of, of things to talk about, but um, and and you'll see me looking over at my notes here. But the in in Texas you have in in the United States you have to have probable cause that there was a crime that was committed or is about to be committed. You can use mere suspicion to investigate a potential crime, but you can't arrest somebody without probable cause of a crime. So these officers were working under the uh, assumption that the un the illegal assumption that the almost park law superseded the state of Texas's open carry law in the state of Texas it is not illegal to open carry a, a firearm uh, they passed license to carry a couple of years ago now the only restrictions to that are if you violated the law or an investigation is incurring that a police officer for another thing, like a tra traffic stop, and you have a firearm on you, then they can ask to see your license to carry. They can't use the fact that you have a firearm on your side as justification or as probable cause to identify you. And that's what they were trying to do with CJ. So, you know, moving forward, uh, you know, the, the, whole, the whole arrest um, was very violent. Um, they charged CJ with, I think, disorderly conduct and resisting arrest. The arrest was unlawful, the disorderly conduct, carrying a firearm in a manner uh, um, intended to cause alarm, was a bogus charge. They know it's a bogus charge. They knew it was a bogus charge because he had called the day before and confronted him about it. So, um, you know, in Texas, well, in the United States, police officers have uh, something called qualified immunity. So if they know that a, if they, if they, what they're doing 
um, violates the rights of someone else and they know that they're violating that person's right, they don't, they don't fall under qualified immunity. So they can be held liable for any actions taken against another person. Um, and what they did was a violation of the Bill of Rights. You know, they have a right to keep and bear arms. They have, in Heller versus D.C., that right was affirmed through the Supreme Court that they do have a right to openly carry their firearms. Um, and in the state of Texas, it's been legal for, for many, many years. So anyway, um, I just want to go through a couple of these notes here. So, you know, a lot of people... Um, a lot of people forget that, uh, or a lot of these law enforcement officers forget, and, and politicians are just as bad. They forget that the powers that they're given are given by the citizens to them. They didn't wake up one morning and all of a sudden they have all these supreme powers over the people. The people have elected these, these, these elected officials and these servants of the public to have a little bit more power in order to provide safety and security. So... What these public officials are failing to recognize is the powers that have been given to them can be taken away from them. They don't, they don't own those powers. Those powers are on loan to them. So, uh, you know, a lot of these politicians think that they're above the law. A lot of these police officers feel that they're exempt from certain laws, and they're not. And I think the Almost Park Police Department is going to learn that the hard way. Um so the First Amendment audit or audit that these gentlemen were doing, uh, so the First Amendment, you know, um, it's a freedom of speech, you know, just to kind of recap, freedom of speech, peaceable assembly, petition the government for redress of grievances. So yesterday's protest was, you know, protest walk was an affirmation of previous First Amendment audits where citizens had tried to, you know, uh, peace of, peaceably um, assemble to let the Almost Park PD know that what they were doing was illegal uh, and a violation of the, of the uh, Second Amendment. So they used the First Amendment to bring light to the problem of the Second Amendment. And yesterday's rally was another furtherance of that. Um, that rally was a peaceable assembly of people who had firearms and uh, took, took a petition to um, the courthouse there, City Hall, whatever that building was, uh, to let the city know that what they did was unacceptable for the citizens of, of the state of Texas. Um, so I, I covered Heller versus D.C. Um, so the other thing is, is you know, there's, I, I talked about probable cause. You know, the police can't just come up to somebody and demand to see their ID. You know, this isn't a stop an ID state. Those laws don't exist in Texas. And there was nothing done for these gentlemen that caused their arrest that or led up to their arrest that they did that was a violation of law. It was these these officers, these almost park uh, police officers, were being bullies. They were being empowered by, empowered by their city government to be bullies, and they're going to pay. And un unfortunately, they're going to pay probably a lot of money. Um, that is then in turn going to impact the citizens of Almost Park. I mean, the services that the citizens there receive are going to be impacted because of the poor decision making and you know basically poor values and morals of the of public officials that are in that area. Um, So about the uh, you know final thoughts. My final thoughts on this topic are, um, you know, there's been a there's been a concerted effort in the liberal media. You know, the coastal, the coastal media centers. You know, the West Coast, California, through movies, independent films, um, a lot of uh, a lot of media outlets that are that are uh, home based in California. Um, Seattle, you know, a lot of tech companies use their platforms to further their agenda, Yahoo and Google, um, but also on the East Coast with New York, Atlanta, you know, very large concentrations of Democrats, liberal ideas, and they're using their platforms, platforms that have been uh, made powerful by the citizens of, of the United States um, by consumption of these products. They've used this platform to marginalize and criminalize uh, gun owners. You've got these media outlets that are using their platform 
to criminalize um, gun owners or make them appear to be criminals, uh, violent thugs, um, scary people, rednecks, um, you know, they cling to their Bibles and their guns and, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And, and in reality, uh, you know, these are just good constitutional American patriots who in most cases have already served their country, have gone to war, um, you know, Vietnam, Iraq, Desert Storm, Afghanistan, Syria, you know, these people are coming back from having put their lives on the line because they, they, uh, they believe in the Constitution. They believe in what the Bill of Rights stands for. They believe in the separation of powers. They believe in the limitations of government. And they believe in liberty. And what people who don't sacrifice think that uh, they or they feel that, you know, we've grown beyond that, that we're more a mature society, that we're more um, advanced in our ability to process. But I go back to the statements that I made earlier about politicians in power. You know, there's an old saying, absolute power corrupts absolutely. When these, when these politicians have all of the law enforcement, their standing army, so to, so to speak, when they have the ability to call on a standing army to enforce laws that they pass without any uh, pushback from the, from the population, you get what you have in, in uh, you know, like in Russia, where you have oligarchs, a small minority of people controlling the majority of the people. Or you have in China, where you have in a lot of these other areas where you have dictatorships and, and, uh, and, and communists and socialists. You have powerful people who were put in position because, you know, like in Venezuela, because they were able to, um, you know, convince the people to put them in power. But then they don't relinquish that power. And as long as they continue to pass laws and be legal in how they do it, they use the court systems, they use the Constitution, they use the, the, uh, the powers of Congress, then they can pass laws to make it illegal to remove them. And they're doing it all legally. And the people who have been disarmed have no power to resist that kind of, that kind of tyrannical government. Now, let's talk about tyranny for a moment. Uh, you know, there's a lot of arguments that tyranny um, isn't something that the United States will ever see. And, you know, AR-15s are no deterrent to tyrants. Well, I'll just argue it this way. If I went to Iraq, uh, I went in Desert Storm, and I know the amount of resistance that is being felt in Afghanistan and Syria. And these people don't have standing armies. They don't have bombers. They don't have howitzers. They don't have you know, M1 Abrams. They don't have aircraft or ships, but they have small arms. And through those small arms, they're able to hold up a significant defense of their property, of their lives, of their, the areas that they hold. And they can use those small arms to continue to push back uh, people that they feel are violating their, their uh, right to life. So, you know, the argument that, you know, small arms are no defense to, uh, you know, a standing army, I'll say that's not true, and we've seen time and time again where that's been proven to not be true. So, not that there were go, not that anybody ever wants to see that. But you know, there's a saying: a fear of uh, when the government fears its people, you have liberty. And you know, our government should fear the people. There should be some concern that they're going to be held accountable. That the people are going to have the ability to use the powers of the Second Amendment to ensure that the powers of the rest of the Bill of Rights aren't infringed upon, that the Fourth Amendment isn't infringed upon, that you know, you're, you're, you have a right to uh, due process and you have a right to probable cause before arrest and you have a right to be secure in your home from unlawful searches and seizures. We fought a revolution to uh, secure these rights, to ensure that these rights that every human is born with and the United States recognizes better than any other country. And to forget that we fought this revolution, to think that we've matured beyond that, I think is very arrogant of the generation that we live in today. Um, and I, I think it speaks to uh, society in general. So anyway, I'm going to show uh, some, some clips, some highlights from yesterday's rally. Uh, C.J. Grisham's wife was there. She, she said a few words. I, I cut in a little bit of that. You're going to see some of the other um, First Amendment auditors in the San Antonio area. Um, there's the uh, Batusi, I think is his name. Um, he's the one that uh, 
ran a case up to the Fourth Circuit. I believe it was the Fourth Circuit, uh, Turner versus Driver. Um, that was a um, a law protecting the um, citizens of of the fourth the district the fourth district of the United States from having their uh, rights violated for using a camera in public spaces. So that was a that was an important case. Um, so anyway, I'm going to show some of these. Uh, I'm going to show this video, and then I'll come back and talk to you. There's one person in here that I want to highlight. And I wanted to talk about her real quick. Um, so anyway, enjoy the clips, and I'll be back. Okay. Um, I know, um, Up to your mouth. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Yeah. yeah. Hold the button. Yeah. yeah. Okay. I know CJ's short. Um, I'm a little bit shorter, so I apologize for that. That's usually one of the first things people remark on when they meet him is his stature. Um, I know this past week and a half people have been commenting on another body part of his and that's uh, the size of his you know what and how, how big they are for what happened in uh, almost Park in the last week and a half. Um, so we're going to keep the actual size of those under wraps today and yeah, yes, I, I sure everyone appreciates that. Um, he is not here today just for advice. Uh, yeah, legalistic issues and to also just kind of keep the focus on what this rally is really about. It's not about CJ, it's about what almost a uh, police department has been doing to everyone the last, I think, two months. So that is what it's for and I hope everyone, if you don't know the full history, then talk to people, let everyone who is interested, not just CJ, not just Jan. Thank you, Texas is an open carry state. And CJ Grisham has done a lot of work in Texas to make Texas open carry. It hasn't always been legal, uh, but it has always been legal for long arms. Um, the problem is the city of Almost Park arrested CJ Grisham and uh, charged him on crimes unrelated to the open carry of his firearm. Uh, he was protesting some previous arrests and told the chief that he was going to be protesting and the chief wasn't having any of it uh, arrested him in a violent way put him in jail and so this this protest march was uh, was planned and it's being executed good job cj 
Can you enter anything? No, I live right there. Oh, okay. It's on Facebook. <laughs> a lot of people want to know what's going I on, so it's like, whatever. <laughs> Second Amendment Open Carry Texas Rally is sitting in front of the courthouse or in front of the uh, mayor's office at Almost Park. So organized in support of CJ Gershon. Good job, CJ. I wanted to talk. So you know, in the in the video, um, as we're coming up to Almost Park, there's a a young lady standing out there, and she's talking to some of the people that are walking by, and. I bring her up because a little later on there was a, a group of people, it was around 6 or 7 o'clock that evening uh, when almost Park PD came back out and they were still kind of hanging around uh, the police department there and one of the neighbors called the police. He had gotten into a verbal altercation with uh, one of the people that were there, uh, one of the protesters that was there and he was getting you know irate about uh, being filmed and Yet he was out confronting this other person. A lot of people don't understand that if you can see it, it can be filmed. It's not against the law. That's the that's the power that the police use to do surveillance on others. You know, there's no inherent right to privacy when you're in public. So anyway, regardless, so this lady comes out. You know, the police show up, and and the I'm sorry, before the lady shows up, the police come out. Um, you know, these protesters are still there. They confront the officers that show up. The officers that get in the car and leave, they know that they're being called out. So they, they leave, which is, you know, which is probably the appropriate response for, for them at this point, you know, with all the lawsuits coming, investigations, etc. So anyway, uh, they're walking around and there was a lady that was out there. It was the same lady that, that um, you see in the video uh, at the end here. Um, and she is talking to the uh, protesters and, and they're having a cordial dialogue. Husband rolls up, you know, he's got a firearm on him. He's a licensed to carry holder. Good for him, you know, props, kudos. But I wanted to point out one thing that this young lady said, and I think that this is indicative of a lot of, uh, a lot of people in the United States. And she says to these gentlemen that she doesn't want the responsibility of, of protecting her own family. And I was actually aghast by that at first, but I think that we're seeing that in a lot of different ways. I think people don't want the responsibility of protecting themselves. And through that feeling, that emotional response of not wanting to protect themselves, they have convinced themselves that it's better to outsource their safety and security to a police department that may respond in minutes, half hour, an hour, you know, depending on, or ever, if they don't get a call, you know, and in that period of time where you're waiting for the police to show up to help protect you because you've abdicated, abdicated your personal safety to a government agency, a police department, you're responsible for your safety, whether that's three minutes or 30 minutes or three hours or three days. You have, you have a primary responsibility to provide for your safety and the cops can't be everywhere. And if you've if you've abdicated your abdicated your responsibility to a police department, you are naive and you are dangerously naive, and you should really rethink where your positions are 
uh, when it comes to your own personal safety. Anyway, if you like this video, give it a thumbs up. I'd appreciate that. Uh, I know this is a long video. There's a lot going on in this video. And if you made it this far, um, I really do appreciate that. I do gun reviews. I do knife reviews. I do gear reviews. And I do talk politics. Um, so if you haven't subscribed yet, you know, I'd really appreciate it. Uh, it helps motivate me to continue to put this type of content out there. And if you disagree with what I say, you know, by all means, throw it in the comment section. I will be happy to engage with you. Have a great day and stay safe. Thanks.